Good morning. I want to talk to you just a little bit about Allen Ginsberg. I promised um, some more um, visual and a little more interactive uh, lectures on the poetry, and we're going to start with Allen Ginsberg, especially with How, which is his uh, most famous um, poem. I do want to make sure that you read background information, um, that you read the online notes that I have out there, that you read the biographical information in your text, which is on page 1392. I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the important things in the biographical information, and then I'm going to read to you some important lines from Howell and talk to you, not not all of them by any means, it's a very long poem. Um, but I'm going to uh, talk to you about some important lines. And uh, again, I want you to make sure that you go back and look at those online notes, um, especially for, for these poems. Um, Allen Ginsberg's pretty much a, a complete, a quintessential representative of his time. Um, how um, kind of ushered in the 1960s um, and the era of the the beat poets or the beatniks and uh, much of the poetry of this time um, from Allen Ginsberg's reading of, of Howell in a, um, a public space uh, which kind of became the the format for a lot of modern poetry and what you what you have are some you know um, poetry readings and things like that, because poetry is often meant to be heard. Um, what we know, uh, I think probably when you look at how uh, in some of the modern poems, you'll realize that um, much of the content, some of the formatting is very, very similar to modern music, modern rap, hip hop, um, trap some of the other kinds of music that that you all are familiar with uh, modern music both thematically and compositionally um, this was the emerging counterculture the counterculture was uh, in opposition to the 1950s the Eisenhower years uh, the years of conformity the years of traditionalism patriotism all of those things. And then with the 60s, you had civil rights unrest. You had um, the beginnings of the Vietnam conflict. You had protests against those. You had um, all kinds of alternative, quote, alternative lifestyles uh, being addressed, being um, put out there in mainstream. Um, Ginsburg with Howell became both the poet part of the poetry and part of history because we cannot separate Ginsburg's poetry from the historical context uh, of the poem. He was born um, to a Russian immigrant mother who was um, basically the victim of very, very serious uh, mental illness. Uh, in fact, was, was institutionalized for much of her adult life. Um, Ginsburg himself was very, very intelligent. Um, he just couldn't seem to follow the rules, uh, as most of the people, rules were uh, pretty much bad words for them. Um, he was accepted into Columbia, New York City, and um, was later expelled simply because he wanted, said he wanted to draw attention to a maid who had not been doing her job properly, and so he drew some obscene pictures and wrote profanity and obscenity in the dust, apparently, to uh, indicate to her her lack of uh, fulfilling her responsibilities, but he was expelled from Columbia for that. He also became very close friends with William Burroughs, who was um, very inventive, quite the modern writer himself. He was also able to introduce Ginsburg to uh, a lot of the other modern writers. He was also a drug addict. Um, they traveled to Tanzania, to Mexico, 
uh, to other places. He did all kinds of odd, odd jobs, um, you know, temporary kinds of uh, work. Um, he supposedly had um, what he would call the critical central experience of his life. He had what he called, referred to as an auditory vision. Um, thought he heard William Blake um, reading poetry and said from this auditory vision, which may or may not have been chemically induced, um, that he realized that his true purpose here on earth, his life, was to wake up to God, the God that he had recognized as a part of this um, this vision. He eventually did graduate from uh, Columbia, went back, did graduate, but he left Columbia under a cloud of suspicion because a um, um, guy he had kind of gotten um, close to uh, was living with him and had stolen a lot of uh, merchandise and pretty much was using um, Ginsburg's facilities to store his stolen merchandise. And, of course, Ginsburg was um, suspected to have been part of that. In lieu of going to jail, he spent eight months in a psychiatric institute. And that would be uh, pivotal in one of the parts of um, section three of Howell when he refers to Carl Solomon, who was a, a patient in the psychiatric institute at the time of his incarceration there. And he refers to him over and over um, in section three of Howell. He later left New York, went to San Francisco, where he felt a great deal freer to express his his um, ideas, his uh, rather radical at the time ideas about government, about uh, society, about um, more traditional ritualistic kind of uh, lifestyles. He read uh, Howl at Sixth Gallery in 1956, and it has been said that this first reading um, was the birth trauma of the Beat Generation. And William Carlos Williams, remember the Red Wheelbarrow uh, guy, was, um, was kind of a, a mentor to Allen Ginsberg and um, lauded him at the beginning of, of his first reading. He said, hold back the edges of your gowns, ladies, we're going through hell. This was pretty auspicious um, opening uh, for this poem. And um, when Ginsburg left the mental hospital, um, he became aware of William Carlos Williams and um, he had very much influenced him as well as um, Kerouac. Um, Jack Kerouac's um, long kind of tumbling lines and almost uh, stream of consciousness of writing really uh, influenced him greatly. Um, he was also influenced heavily by Walt Whitman, who uh, really is at the end of American Lit One, but he is the father of free verse poetry. He is the father of modern poetry. And for those of you who've been in American Lit One, if you remember um, Song of Myself, the long lines, um, kind of jumbled lines sometimes almost, if, you, if you're not seeing them on the page, they almost appear to be prose when you hear them. And he does mimic that. In fact, the second poem that we're going to look at, a supermarket in California, he directly addresses uh, Walt Whitman in that. Um, in the 60s, he was widely known, widely traveled. Um, he had adopted some tenets of Buddhism, 
uh, and he served as kind of a guru for a lot of younger people who were disoriented by the the Vietnam War. He, quote, held office hours in a lot of universities um, across the country. He was uh, pretty much lauded as um, the representative of the time. Um, he also uh, argued for revision of homosexuality laws. Um, he w lived openly with another poet, uh, Peter Orlovsky, for many, many years and wrote openly about their um, about their relationship. Um, with Ginsburg's death, contemporary American poetry lost one of its most definitive and revolutionary figures. But we do have the poems. I'm going to read with you um, a few lines from Howe. Uh, you can read the whole thing for yourself. But I think it's pretty amazing how um, this poem is not only representative of that movement, that counterculture movement, in the 19, or late 1950s, early 60s. And when we talk about decades, when we talk about 60s or 50s or whatever, what we mean is it's not just that it automatically started in 1960 and ended in 1969. It, it, we really refer to that whole idea. So, of course, this counterculture movement had already begun at the end of the 50s. And some of it would go well into the early 70s. Um, but look, read with me on 1394. And notice there is the, the footnote, the dedication, if you will, of the whole poem to uh, Carl Solomon. And you can see the footnote there at the bottom. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz who bared their brains to heaven under the ale and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated, who passed through universities with radiant, cool eyes hallucinating Arkansas in Blake-like tragedy among the scholars of war, who were expelled from the academies for crazy and publishing obscene odes on the windows of the skull, who cowered in unshaven rooms and underwear, burning their money in waste baskets and listening to the terror through the wall, who got busted in their pubic beards returning through Laredo with a belt of marijuana for New York, who ate fire in paint hotels or drank turpentine in Paradise Alley, death or purgatory their torsos night after night with dreams, with drugs, with waking nightmares, alcohol, and cock and endless balls, incomparable blind streets of shuddering cloud, enlightening in the mind, leaping toward poles of Canada and Patterson, illuminating all the motionless world of time between. Uh, line number one, especially, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. Um, can certainly be uh, quite relevant for us today. Uh, and you can continue on um, reading, as you can see, long, long lines. Um, and pretty much, you know, for some of you, it may be a little offensive, full of profanity and vulgarity and uh, obscenity. Skip on down uh, to page 1399. About line... 72 maybe where it says ah carl while you are not safe i am not safe and now you're really in the total animal soup of time again referring to carl solomon so when the weakest and most vulnerable among us is not safe nobody's safe um even if they don't realize the danger Section two is basically a railing against Moloch, who is a Canaanite god uh, in the Bible. And 
this Canaanite God, if you look at your, your fit notes, um, basically required, he was considered a pagan um, God, and he required parents to sacrifice their children uh, on the burnt offerings, not animals, but their own flesh and blood. And so section two of Howell deals with um, what he calls Moloch which he's equating with contemporary society. He's equating with materialistic uh, capitalism, if you will. Um, and he starts on section two at the bottom of 1399. What sphinx of cement and aluminum bashed open their skulls and ate up their brains and imagination? Of course, this is pretty much, pretty much, um, Figurative at this point, Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ash cans, and unobtainable dollars, children screaming under the stairways, boys sobbing in armies, old men weeping in the parks. Moloch, Moloch, nightmare of Moloch, Moloch the loveless, mental Moloch, Moloch the heavy judger of men, Moloch, the incomprehensible prison. Moloch, the crossbound, soulless jailhouse and congress of sorrows. Moloch, whose buildings are judgment. Moloch, the vast stone of war. Moloch, the stunned governments. And skip on down to about line 80. Moloch, whose love is endless oil and stone. Moloch, whose soul is electricity and banks. Moloch, whose poverty is the specter of genius. Moloch, whose fate is a cloud of sexless hydrogen. Moloch, whose name is the mind. And then skip down to about line 87. They broke their backs, lifting Moloch to heaven, pavements, trees. Radios, tons, lifting the city to heaven, which exists and is everywhere about us. Visions and omens, hallucinations, miracles, ecstasies, gone down the American River. Dreams, adorations, illuminations, religions, the whole boatload of sensitive bullshit. And you can read uh, down to the rest of uh, that Moloch. Our society, this contemporary world that we have created has completely destroyed us. And then set, uh, the third section uh, refers um, specifically to Carl Solomon. Uh, again, Carl Solomon, I am with you in Rockland where you're madder than I am. I'm with you in Rockland where you must feel very strange. I am with you in Rockland where you imitate the shade of my mother. I am with you in Rockland where you've murdered your 12 secretaries. I'm with you in Rockland where you laugh at this invisible humor. I am with you in Rockland where... We are great writers on the same dreadful typewriter. I am with you in Rockland where your condition has become serious and was reported on the radio. I am with you in Rockland where the faculties of the skull no longer admit the worms of the senses. Um, everybody is mad in this world. And then uh, on page 1402, the footnote, if you'll read it, uh, he refers to Peter, um, Allen, Solomon, Lucian, Kerouac, Burroughs, Cassidy, uh, the people, many of the people who are named in um, Jack Kerouac's uh, writing. Um, he refers to all of what he refers to as holy, uh, maybe because they're often worshipped in our society. Um, and then again, at the, in the last section, he refers to Moloch once again. And then the shorter poem is um, A Supermarket in California beginning on page 1402, and he's uh, specifically addressing Walt Whitman in this poem, who is, again, the father of free verse poetry, modern poetry. And he says, of course, the supermarket in California becomes kind of a microcosm for the modern world. He says, what thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman, for I walk down the side streets under the trees with a headache of self-conscious looking at the full moon. In my hungry fatigue and shopping for images, I went into the neon fruit supermarket dreaming of your enumerations. 
What peaches and what penumbras? Whole families shopping at night, aisles full of husbands, wives in the avocados, babies in the tomatoes, and you, Garcia Lorca, what were you doing down by the watermelons? Of course, Garcia Lorca is a um, surrealistic painting painter um, where you can see the realism, you can see the actual uh, images, and you understand, you see what they mean, uh, but they are distorted in some way. Um, I saw you, Walt Whitman, childless, lonely old grubber, poking among the meats in the refrigerator and eyeing the grocery boys. I heard you asking questions of each. Who killed the pork chops? What price bananas? Are you my angel? I wandered in and out of the brilliant stacks of cans following you and followed in my imagination by the store detective. We strode down the open corridors together in our solitary fancy, tasting artichokes, possessing every frozen delicacy and never passing the cashier. We don't have to pay for it. Where are we going, Walt Whitman? The doors close in an hour. Which way does your beard point tonight? I touch your book and dream of our odyssey in the supermarket and feel absurd. Will we walk all night through the solitary streets? The streets add shade to shade, lights out in the houses. We'll both be lonely. Will we be stro stroll dreaming of the lost America of love past blue automobiles and driveways, home to our silent cottage? Ah, dear father, gray beard, lonely old courage teacher, what America did you have when Charon quit poling his ferry and you got out on the smoking bank and stood watching the boat disappear on the black waters of Lethe? And of course, this was written in Berkeley uh, in 1955, the homage to uh, Walt Whitman at the beginning of the Beat uh, Poets, uh, the Beatnik Generation, the counterculture movement. Uh, where are we going, Walt Whitman? Where is this world headed? Um, what is our place in this modern society?